everyone. Good morning. Welcome, LMDA, to day two. My voice has returned. It's a miracle. All right. Um, so we have a, a really uh, full day of conversations planned. So I'm going to invite everyone to rejoin us in the atrium and to find a seat so we can begin our first plenary session. Uh, our panelists are ready and waiting. Uh, beforehand, I have a few announcements about the day. All right. Do not forget, hashtag LMDA17. Uh, when I was uh, homesick last night, unable to join you at a nocturne, I was able to follow along some of the good conversations that were happening. So help out people like me <laughs> and hashtag uh, and keep those conversations going online. Uh, don't forget to sign up to march with LMDA at uh, San Francisco's Pride on Sunday. There's a sign-up sheet over at registration. Um, join us. Actually, today during lunch, we're going to be uh, creating our own LMDA banner that we're going to march with uh, through, the uh, through the parade. So you're welcome to join us during lunch uh, and stop by one of the OSHA rooms, and we're going to have some, some crafts going on. Uh, for lunch, also... Patrick Dooley at Shotgun Players, whom you all met yesterday morning, has uh, graciously invited us to actually join him at his space, which is just across the street, uh, for lunch and conversation with Patrick Dooley. So basically, if you just go grab your lunch, and then we can head over there uh, and chat in an informal way and uh, with Patrick. And uh, actually, if anyone is interested in doing that, if you could if you know now, if you could raise your hands, that'd be amazing. So I can give a, a head count to him. All right, let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. All right. And if you want to add, uh, add your, just let me know, and I'll just let them know we have about 20 people coming. Um, great. So this afternoon also is our Friday uh, field trips. We have a few different activities going on. We are actually going, uh, Berkeley Rep has invited us to go to their ground floor um, to uh, meet with their artists. Uh, that sign-up is happening at registration as well, and we are looking for people who have cars, who would be willing to share some seats and drive people over to the space. Um, so if you have already signed up and you have a car and you would like to, uh, to volunteer some of your seats, if you could actually make a note of that on your by your name and let us know how many seats you have available, that would be great. Uh, we also have Green Turgy Boot Camp happening this afternoon, uh, which is going to be great. Uh, all the slots have actually been filled, um, but I hear that if uh, it's something you're really, really passionate about, um, that there could be a little wiggle room. Uh, I also want to let you know that Z Hartman has traveled all the way from South, South Africa to, um, <laughs> to lead a really exciting contemplative and performative experience uh, with us this afternoon called Traveling to the Theater and Back. We're going to meet in Osher A, and she'll lead us through that experience, and there's a sign-up for that as well at registration. So please, I'm going to be there. So let's please <laughs> join us there um, this afternoon. Um, just uh, two more reminders. Uh, just be aware of your personal space, of, of where you are in uh, the Ed Roberts campus. We want to make sure that we keep pathways clear um, and aisles clear so that uh, traffic can move freely. So just be aware of that. And then also when we're in the atrium, this room, I want to remind you to use the mics uh, so that our lovely HowlRound guests can uh, fully hear what you all have to say. Great. And so on that note, I'm going to hand it off to Brad. Oh, one more. Here's Ken. Just one suggestion for anyone who's interested in going to Shotgun, because um, the places where we get lunch often have lines. So I suggest trying to like get your lunch sometime during the morning and pack it away, and then we'll we'll leave here at like 12:05. So if that's something you want to do, like plan ahead for your lunch, because we won't have time to wait around and get it and then go to the restaurant. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. All right, and now over to Brad Rothbart. Hi everyone, and welcome to. We're sitting around talking about access. Is this on? Can people hear me? Good. Um, before we start, before we even begin to talk, um, I have a short video I would like to show everyone.
But if anybody tell you that I miss practice, if if if, if a coach say I miss practice and y'all hear it, then that's that. I mean, I might have missed one practice this year, but if if somebody say he doesn't come to practice, it can be one practice out of all the practices this year. That's enough. If I can't practice, I can't practice, man. I'm hurt. I'm hurt. I mean, simple as that. It ain't about that. I mean, it's it's not about that at all. You know what I'm saying? I mean. But it's 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 easy to, to to talk about. It's easy to sum it up when you just talk about practice. We sitting here. I supposed to be the franchise player, and we're in here talking about practice. I mean, it, listen, we talking about practice, not a game, not a game, not a game. We talking about practice, not a game, not a, not not the game that I go out there and and die for. And play every game like it's my last. Not the game. We're talking about practice, man. I mean, how silly is that? I mean, we're talking about practice. I know I'm supposed to be there. I know I'm supposed to lead by example. I know that. And I'm not I'm not shoving it aside, you know, like it don't mean anything. I know it's important. I do. I honestly do. But we're talking about practice, man. What are we talking about? Practice? We're talking about practice, man. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about practice. We're talking about practice. We ain't talking about the game. We're talking about practice, man. When you come in the arena and you see me play, you see me play, don't you? You see me give everything I got, right? But we talking about practice right now. We talking about practice. Man, I look, I hear you. I, it's funny to me, too. I, I mean, it's strange, it's strange to me, too. But we talking about practice, man. We're not even talking about the game, the actual game, when it matters. We're talking about practice. How the hell can I make my teammates better by practice? So all of that is interesting and also really troubling at some level because, of course, the racism embedded in there is kind of terrifying. We have white men clashing at a black man's team, and I wanted to bring that into the room and have people sit with that, and if that makes you uncomfortable, that's fine. And if it doesn't, I would say check your s issues around racism. But what's most interesting about this clip is this is not the entire clip. This is what's shown, this is what's recorded. There is four more minutes of this. And the story there is that Allen Iverson grew up in Hampton, Virginia, very, very poor. He was actually imprisoned for a year for stealing a pint of milk from the high school and had to be pardoned by the governor. One of his, now, he became a basketball player, had lots of money. His best friend did not want to leave Virginia, did not want to leave his home because that was his home, that was his land, that was who he was. Earlier that week, his best friend had been shot and killed. He had asked for time off to mourn. He had asked for time to go to the funeral. The organization, which was more committed to their appearance as an entertainment organization than to the people in the organization, had refused that. So. In the name of self-care, he skipped practice. Now, I would say that a working definition of access that we could start with today is the ability of an organization or an individual to support and understand someone's needs, whether or not those needs seem reasonable to that organization or individual. And so this is the only part of the clip that is ever shown. No one ever gets to the rest of it. No one ever gets to the reason. There is also something that's read as funny about an undereducated black man crying for the sentence to go. 
um, which is its own issue. Now, personally, when I, at Stanford, wanted to work on Allen Iverson and images of African American culture and Im images of language, use of language, I was told that that did not bear academic scrutiny. Um, but what I, what I do want to talk about is that, that definition of ac access. So if you can keep that in your mind as we go through, that would be wonderful. Now, Allen Iverson had a lack of agency um, as a person and as an artist, as a player. And therefore, instead of introducing people and taking away their agency, I am going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Melissa Hillman. Um, I am from here. I'm the artistic director of Impact Theater here in Berkeley. I write as Bitter Gertrude. And that's it. And I'm socially awkward. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Ilana Brownstein. I'm the director of new work at Company One Theater in Boston. I'm also on the faculty of the Boston University School of Theater and am the founding dramaturg of Playwrights Commons. Yes. Yes, I use she, her, hers. So do I. Hello, um, my name is Michael Chemers. Uh, I'm a professor, associate professor, maybe full professor by the time I finish the sentence. I don't know. Uh, at uh, the of dramatic literature at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Formerly, I was at uh, I was the founding director of the BFA in dramaturgy program at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, ooh, yeah, a lot of my mafia is here today, um, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm Brad Rothbart. Um, I have my own excitement about doing this panel and frustration we're doing it again because um, I've been doing this panel for 20 years in one form or another. And while the world statistics, the problems are still there. I am a freelance dramaturg. I write for American theater. I am an angry and passionate disabled person who wants to fight for justice. And my pronouns are they, them, and theirs. Buenos dias, y'all. I'm Kat Rodriguez, uh, and Brad invited me on this panel yesterday, I think. So I'm not in your program, <laughs> but I'm Kat. Um, I am a freelance dramaturg. Um, uh, I'm currently at Yale School of Drama uh, getting my MFA in dramaturgy and the dramatic criticism. Um, and I am she, her, hers. I also respond to y'all. Um, say that non facetiously, uh, and I am a light skinned Cajun Latina. Hi, I'm Haritha Pickery. Uh, I'm based in Sudbury, Ontario. I recently got my MA from York University in Toronto. Um, I've been working with the Sudbury Theatre Company, uh, and Sudbury Theatre Centre, sorry, <laughs> and also Pat the Dog Theatre Creation, which is a playwright development centre in, um, in Ontario. Uh, oh, also, I am a new editor on the Theatre Times for Canada, so I would be really excited to talk to folks from Canada about the work they do. Oh, preferred pronouns are she, her, hers. Hi, um, I'm Andrea Kovic. I'm she, her, hers. And um, I'm an intern in Seattle with a small company, Taproot Theater Company. Um, and I just graduated with a master's last year, so I'm still figuring out that transition. And because I'm not feeling like I have the credentials everyone else has, I will keep that. I am also, um, I have an architecture degree, so I'm an accessibility consultant. So I know a lot about access to buildings. So that's kind of my other hat. So we're here not to, while we want to talk about access to buildings, and while that's really important and other issues around access, whether those are economic, whether those have to do with life decisions like motherhood, um, 
whether those have to do with trans with being gendered or being raced in a certain way or claiming an identity in a what prevents both you as a viewer and as an art so that's really the question on the table rule here because this is how we play it um, if frustrated make some news of your own don't walk out make it interesting challenge us share with us agree with us but don't walk out okay stay in the room so I guess I would like to pass it first to Michael Chemers and he can he can talk a little bit about disability or um, the changing your your Liminality with disability, um, okay. if you want, or just liminality in general. You know. uh, thanks, Brad. I'm very happy to be part of this panel, but I'm, I share Brad's frustration that we are still having it. Um, so, in my piece on disability in the theater, specifically, I was looking at freak shows in the 19th century, and this, of course, is a very controversial topic among disability scholars, however, I was also told, like Brad, that it didn't bear academic scrutiny. So I had to fight, on the one hand, um, I had to navigate a, a way to ground my research in what uh, I think you heard yesterday during the Hot Topics is called the social model of disability, which is uh, the notion that um, disability, like race, like gender, like sexual identity, is a socially constructed and therefore, at least in some way, partially performative identity. Uh, which bears the same kind of perverse, highly politicized, highly discriminatory relationship to what social model theorists call impairment that gender bears to biological sex or race bears to skin color. We know that these connections are perverse. We know that they are politically expedient, and we know that they are discriminatory, right? So, uh, but it's much more difficult to make people understand this and I got a lot of pushback, for instance, from uh, my professors of color who were saying you're trying to steal the discriminatory uh, position. Uh, and I thought I'm not really interested in playing uh, what my colleague Cynthia Lee calls the um, oppression Olympics, <laughs> right? Uh, I'm just trying to do some work that's going to be a benefit to people. Um, but at the same time, this notion that the freak show could be, uh, in the 19th century in America, could be examined as a type of performance art rather than as a expression of the lowest possible culture, which is in itself a problem, right? Um, or as the always already a priori model of um, discriminatory disability uh, performance, right? Um, was there a way to examine this work um, in a way that would be empowering to people who are alive now. Um, and I think I did that. Uh, eventually became a book a l after a long, a long uh, uh, struggle. Um, but yeah, what else? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling on. Absolutely fine. You, you ramble. But how did that affect, I understand how the work might have affected other people's access, that you were writing for other people. But how did that affect your access to theater, whether it was within the the academy or without. Uh, thanks, Brad. Yeah. Um, so my own relationship to disability, to physical, well, I should say to impairment, is complicated and nuanced. And uh, my students know I go in and out of needing to use a cane because of injuries that I got when I was younger. Uh, when I'm using a cane, I per I'm performing disability. When I'm not, I'm not. But people look at me and they say, well, how, how are you able to, what right do you have to speak on this? And I thought, I don't really have to justify my academic curiosity. But I did. <laughs> they made me do it. Um, so this gave me an insight that I, I don't think I would have had otherwise into issues of access into the theater. And uh, one of the things that I was delighted to find when I went to Carnegie Mellon was that they had built a new theater after the passage of the ADA in 1920. If you guys uh, don't know what the, the Americans with Disabilities Act that this cafe, I believe, is named after, um, was passed uh, by groups including people like Ed Roberts, right? 
who was a great advocate uh, for the independent living movement and for disability rights, uh, whose campus this is named after, uh, were able to put pressure on the Bush administration to pass this. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so this theater was built after the passage of the ADA, and so therefore it had full accessibility. It has full accessibility. The, uh, uh, the cr uh, what's the name of the theater? The Chosky. The Chosky, thank you. Um, and it, that includes wheelchair accessible catwalks. I'd never seen such a thing before, right? So as a result, we were able to um, bring several, pro several students through the program who otherwise would not have been able to complete their requirements, like their crew requirements, for instance. It suddenly became a non-issue because yes, we had two quadriplegic students while I was there and they were all able to fulfill their crew requirements. Easy, easy. Uh, but then at the same time, we're looking at theaters all over the region that do not have that kind of access, not only for people who want to work in the theater, but for people who want to see the theater. Um, partially because, as you know, anyone who, who's confronted this problem knows, people with disabilities have unique needs and you can't always accommodate, or people find it uh, difficult, maybe, to embrace the mentality that they need in order to accommodate people. Yes, I'm still not doing what. I invite everybody to, to capture Michael or find him, or because he's a brilliant man after this and I'm chat with him. You, well, you're not, a, but also, yeah, you, you're not. <laughs> and I think the fact that you're not, the fact that it's a difficult thing to confront, the fact that it's a difficult question to answer is also worth interrogating, right? Whether we do that here or whether you do that in your own space. And just think about the fact he, a very, very interesting, well-spoken man, couldn't answer a simple question. How do I get that question? <laughs> what was the question? The question was how does, how does all of this affect your, your um, questions on access? How, how is your choices of theoretical stance, your choice of work, it's, uh, affect access. By the way, I'm not complaining well that you didn't answer the question. Yeah. It's just that it's a, a, it's a simple question that is not simple at all, because it makes us confront ourselves. It makes us confront the other people in the room. It makes us confront the institution that we're at. It's a big question that looks little. Um, I would like to. I don't really want to talk all the time because I'm moderating and I'm trying to be moderate and I'm generally immoderate. Um, but I was looking at the panel and I think Pat is truly a brilliant person and a really wonderful thinker. And I also thought, oh my God, we're talking about inclusion and we have no people of color. What am I doing? Oh my God. Well, no, actually, we, well, we have Haritha. That was still one person on a six-person panel. And if I want to advocate for this, I have to be aware of this. And so even though I do not know Pat that well, I reached out to her because that was in my head, that we have, we have to be aware of more than what's just in our experience. I, we have to keep reaching out. So Pat, I invite you to try to address the questions of access and art in whatever way they've impacted your life. Uh, hi, y'all. Um, uh, well, for me, uh, I'm going to approach this from passing. Um, as a light-skinned person of color, um, it's really important that I, that I own um, that privilege uh, of, of the light-skinnedness and the ability to pass. And I think um, this is uh, important uh, and intersects with all areas of uh, access, right? Whether it's um, economic, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, gender, um, sexual orientation, I mean, I could go on and on, um, or, or even, uh, frankly, disability or impairment, right? Um, I s uh, m failed to mention that I'm on the Latinx Theater Commons um, Steering Committee, and we had a meeting in Seattle, um, and we were, talking ab we were talking about this subject, um, and I, you know, uh, people were tackling it in, in terms of architecture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I made a, a very small comment about um, uh, folks who might be with us who had um, disability that weren't uh, physicalized, um, that, y that, you know, one could pass, right, um, seeming like one didn't have a disability but, you know, had, um, but, but did, uh, cognitive or otherwise. Um, and uh, fast forward maybe like a couple, 
a year and a half probably. Um, and someone <coughs> approached me at a, at a, a, a different conference. Uh, it was, was it? I don't. I think it was actually another LTC conference. Um, but but said, um, you know, um, you made that comment, um, and I just wanted to thank you for it. Um, and hearing you say that led me to go get help. Uh, and I just want you to know the impact of that statement. And I, I share that not to like, <laughs> you know, good job, um, but just the importance of uh, reminding ourselves, as, as Brad is inviting us to do, um, to remember the experiences that lie outside of our own. Um, and also when we think about access, it might not be um, what we are um, accustomed to seeing or recognizing as a barrier, right? It might not be a physical one. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of my personal uh, experience, um, going through grad school right now, and I'm sure, uh, you know, and, and having worked in theaters in the past, uh, something that I think is a barrier to access and that some people tap out um, is this kind of capitalist, like, work ethic type thing that values productivity over people that values a product, right? Productivity product uh, over processes um, and over individuals. And something that uh, I, uh, in school, and I know, you know, colleagues in the profession um, struggle with is, is frankly that. Um, and, you know, to connect it back to the, to the video, uh, hi there, hi up there. <laughs> Uh, but c to connect it back to the video, right? When you need a day, you need a day. Um, and somehow uh, that isn't always uh, valued. I think um, it, was, it was at Carnegie Mellon. It wasn't in the School of Drama because we had a very strict uh, attendance <laughs> policy. But in the, in the School of Design, actually, at my best friend um, studied in the School of Design. And one of her, her faculty members instituted a policy that there were three or four days of grace, that if you needed a day, no questions asked, you had those four days. Um, I mean, because sometimes, right, uh, you just need the day, and self-care is important, and allowing people to be judicious, right, um, and, and, and take care of themselves is, is super important. And I think that um, in our culture, uh, we, we set up barriers that are that are sometimes physical, but sometimes also mental, uh, or just the framework itself isn't conducive to taking care of the full person. So I think it's um, really important uh, to keep that in mind. And self-care is something that uh, I'm on a journey of pursuing, <laughs> and I think probably many people in here are as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, now, it's a, again, it's difficult to discuss, and we can't discuss it in. Um, as its own thing, it, there's a lot of intersectionality around access, and that's what we're trying to get at um, right now, is that intersectionality. Um, I, I just want to speak for a moment, because when I went to Stanford, the first thing they said to us was, welcome to boot camp. That was our introduction. Um, and th they take about three, four people a year, so in the six years, there were 20 to 24 people. 20 of us spent time in the Stanford psych ward at some point because that was their commitment to boot camp. Um, it was a truly unhealthy environment for everyone. And in fact, most of those people are not ac academics nor do they want to be because that was our experience of academia. Um, not only did I not be a was I not able to talk about Alan Iverson, I was also very interested in Christina Aguilera and her issues around agency because she took her cultural capital and made a very personal album. And I was told by women who consider themselves feminists that that can't be the truth, that that just had to be a marketing ploy, that she was not intelligent enough to make those decisions. So I want to, I am not interested in the medical model of disability, nor am I interested in the social model. I am interested in the cultural model. And I would say, all of you who do not have a voice in the majority culture, all of you who do not have that social capital, you are disabled by the society. 
welcome to my world, welcome. We have just become a much larger community, and together we can make this. So I would like to pass this to Haritha so that she can talk about the first hearing. Oh, Philippa. say um, like the five tenets of boot camp, like w just so we have an idea of what that entails. Sorry to interrupt. You are a surf and you will do what we tell you to do when we tell you to do it. Lateness is not acceptable. That's two. Um, we reserve the right to ask you to rewrite 20 pages of your 25 page paper the day before it's due if you hand it in early. Um, you, it is not that the paper isn't well written, it is that you are not a good writer. Um, and finally, how dare you do this to me? Any failure was seen as a, we were somehow attacking or failing the faculty member. Um, I, and, uh, I know he's a beloved man and I, I really do like him, but on the anniversary of this killing, I wore to my performances of race class an, Alice, an Allen Iverson jersey. Um, and Harry Elam called me out in front of the class as a wigger. Yeah, I just want to throw that in there. So my trying to support other folks with other issues was not heard, uh, which started me thinking about intersectionality quite a bit. Um, but yeah, boot camp is that you, we will throw you into the fire. You will either be forged or you will melt. If you melt, you are not our problem. If you, if you are forged, welcome to the community. It's utterly, unhe it's utterly unhelpful and utterly unhelpful. Um, yeah, I guess just a couple of things to respond to uh, what's been said. I environments. I've seen many bright, like passionate people just be pulverized by the system. Um, and it's, it's just so upsetting and no one really knows what to do because universities are being increasingly corporatized and they're made to churn out people with degrees who become, uh, who go into professions and even that's not um, a, a guarantee, right? And um, I think too of the way that there's been this development of like a career experience-based economy which glamorizes the life of artists who are very like often in very precarious positions and they say that artists abilities to uh, find opportunities and make something from nothing that is um, that is how we should um, engage other people and entrepreneurs that's that's the way forward rather than looking at the fact that you know it's an inc incredibly unhealthy way to, to live when you're not sure how you're going to to eat and how you're going to take care of yourself when you're uh, within that very stressful kind of environment. So I think that's that's something that troubles me a little bit. And then in terms of race, I think of um, my experiences growing up as an immigrant. Um, so I was born to Indian parents uh, in Ireland, so outside of India, not really attached to that culture. Moved to the States when I was three, and then kind of, uh, I guess my process of assimilation was through 90s TV shows. and. That <laughs> that is how I learned what it is to have a family life and to uh, socialize with people at school and um, just those classic uh, troubles that uh, not troubles the problems that occur in those sitcoms like Boy Meets World and Full House and so on. Um, but then I think of how amazing uh, Master of None was to me, which is um, a, a show on Netflix and it's by Aziz Ansari and uh, Alan Wang, I think is his last name, and uh, the way that they showed me something that was so familiar to me from my ho own home life and that I had just never really given any credibility to it. I had taken uh, other images of what it means to have parents or, or so on from, from things that actually weren't true to my lived experience. And it was just, it was a very powerful moment for me. Um, and something similar happened in a workshop I was in uh, with an indigenous writer. Um, it was it was an incredibly gentle piece. Also, uh, it's set within a domestic space. Uh, it, it really just, fo it's, a, it's very quiet. Um, the main character is an uh, elderly woman and she's moving about her house and 
have family members come in and out, and um, one of the actors in the room, uh, she got overwhelmed with emotion because she recognized those uh, kinds of connections and relationships, and uh, I think what was interesting to her, not interesting, but moving to her was kind of the ordinariness of it, whereas there's this kind of drive to show um, uh, marginalized people in, in very uh, extreme circumstances, right? So with the, the TRC that just happened, there's been art around the residential schools, and, and those are um, very intense forms of uh, representation. But these Alicia, were more, yeah. How did these affect your personal issues around, about your personal travel around access and art? I, th I think it's just the, the idea that the stories we want to see and the, the access we want to create for those storytellers is less about, um, like, I I it's, it's less dramatic in a way <laughs> than, than people think. Um, these, these are experiences that are um, kind of very gentle in, in how they, uh, they m I, I guess, make up your own experience and, and those matter to you in a way that you've never really given credibility to it. Um, but but there are differences, and and you want to be able to see those those particular uh, differences in a way, and and that's how, and and that's why uh, empowering those artists to share their stories like that uh, matters. So. Great, thank you. And again, these are much longer conversations that we should be having, not just here, but forever. Um, I'm reminded of a quote by Mac Wellman, who sat in on a panel like this about ten years ago who said either diversity is very important and naughty and we should spend all of our time discussing it until we figure it out, or else it's very important and naughty and it's impossible to solve and we should never talk about it again. And with that, he walked off stage. Um, I would like to hand the mic next to uh, Ilana Brownstein. Hi, so Brad invited me to um, be part of this panel to talk about the issues of parenthood, uh, specifically motherhood in the theater, and the access issues that come up around that. So uh, first I wanna say, like everybody on this panel, I can't speak for every parent or every mother, I can only speak for myself. And um, I know, Brad, you're very interested in the, the personal impact of these questions, so I'll try and speak to that. Um, so I have a two-year-old at home um, who's really mad at me for not being there. Um, really mad. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm coming, I'm leaving panels at 4.45 or 5 o'clock here so I can catch him right before he goes to bed at 8, you know, at 8 o'clock Boston time. And, you know, we're FaceTiming and he's trying to understand why I am in Broccoli, California. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's my first, it's my first trip away from home in uh, two years. And that's, uh, the last time I was at a LMDA conference was 2014. So, hi, it's nice to see everybody again. I've been on um, motherhood hiatus because it was impossible for me. It's not impossible for everybody, but it was impossible for me to figure out how to maintain a really active professional life in the field, an active professional life in my day-to-day, -day, in my two full-time jobs in the theater, as well as a personal life with my family. And you know, a lot of stuff falls away when you're making those choices. And one of the choices that I had to make was that I was, I pulled out of national conversations um, right at a moment when I was feeling um, sort of at the height of my professional career. I felt like in 2014, I had kind of come to a point where I was um, feeling very confident about my professional life. I was feeling very um, connected. I felt very um, involved in a lot of threads of conversation that were happening across not just the dramaturgical field and the theatrical field, but thinking about where those things intersect with social justice, with public arts advocacy, with um, civic practice in uh, both local and national levels. And then I dropped out. And I am only just beginning to walk back in. And it's really challenging for me, actually. I'm, um, I'm experiencing the thing where I used to be, I was saying this to somebody the other day, I used to be the kind of person, well I'm still the kind of person that loves a conference. Give me a conference any day, I love a conference. Uh, I feel really like rejuvenated and, and uh, inspired by conferences. But I also used to be the person with like the incredible stamina who could just like go to every session, no doubt. I would be out late every night talking to everybody, every day, all day, everywhere. 
can't do it. I'm discovering that this weekend. Um, it's not possible. It might be possible again in the future, but right now it's not. And so I'm having to recalibrate my expectations around what a uh, professional life looks like. And I'm thinking about that personally as I'm also thinking about what is the, um, what is the national or local landscape for parents in the arts. And I, I do want to say that I know that it is challenging for fathers as well. Um, I know that it is challenging for parents um, in, in lots of different ways. I can only really talk right now about what it's like for mothers because um, that's what I am. So uh, I have watched friends of mine who are pregnant um, specifically not hired for jobs they could very well do as pregnant theater people, not hired, um, and, and given a kind of a, uh, a pat on the head and say, boy, this is for your own good, right? And I'm also mindful of the places where I approach fellow artists who are pregnant, who I want to offer an opportunity to, and to say to them, I want to give you this opportunity. I want you to tell me if you can take it. And if you can't, I want to offer it to you when you're ready. Um, and that's been really hard to navigate because I also don't want to recreate the situations of paternalism um, that come with a kind of like, well, I'm pr I want to protect you from having to make a choice that's really hard because you don't know what you're about to walk into, right? Um, so I'm, I'm navigating that at my company when we work with, um, specifically with playwrights who are in the midst of pregnancies um, and trying to figure out how to accommodate them in a way that is helpful for their art but doesn't actually communicate to them that this is a zero-sum game. If you don't take this opportunity now, you can never have it. Because that's how it felt to me. Um, I had to turn down two incredible opportunities, um, one the year I was pregnant and one the year my child was one year old. Uh, opportunities I was waiting for, opportunities I'd waited eight years for. I'd been hoping and praying that I would get asked back to a particular development conference. And when I was asked, I couldn't do it. And it felt clear to me that that ask wasn't going to come around again. Um, and I had to have a long conversation at home about whether this was something I could actually manage, and we decided I couldn't. Um, and that was really tough. So there's a little bit of a heartbreak involved in that, um, as well as trying to make the decisions that are about always trading off, always trading off, right? Yes, I can. Yeah, can I say one last thing before I trade it off? I'd like to um, just offer a statistic, if I may. So there's a group called Mothers Artists Makers. They're based in Ireland, and they offered this statistic recently. Um, they, their argument is that the major cause of gender imbalance in the arts is the exodus of women when they have children. Um, of the 300 members of MAM, uh, over half lost all of their theater or arts income when they became pregnant and uh, became parents. And of the remaining half, 95% suffered greatly reduced income because of lack of opportunity. So I just want to say that as we we're talking in the other panel about artistic directorships and leadership and the rise of women through the ranks, you cannot ignore the fact that um, access for parents is really a, a challenging problem at all levels. I'm going to stand up because this chair is, oh my goodness. All right. <laughs> This, um, what right do you have to talk about these issues? Really spoke to me because when I was, I got my PhD at Cal, right around the corner, and um, I became disabled while I was in grad school. Gradually, my condition is degenerative. And um, that was, I write about a lot of issues about social justice. Um, and I have not written a lot about disability because I feel I I have feel like what right do I have as I negotiate through this new identity where every day is something new, and uh, it's a, it's an interesting thought. Do I have a right to speak about these issues? And I do, and so do you. And one thing I want to talk about is intersectionality and how economic issues of access, economic access is at the center of our industry and access. So when, <laughs> when you are, who this, the pipeline, who's in the pipeline? How do we put people in the pipeline? It starts at the board level, right? Your board is made of able-bodied, white, wealthy men, primarily. Whether that board is a university or the board of your theater. And those people primarily hire able-bodied, white, men from particular uh, level of grad schools for their gatekeeping positions. 
and they in turn hire cisgendered, able-bodied, white men for gatekeeping positions, and so on and so on and so on. And it's not, I don't think it's malicious, but I think that people hire people, mentor people, that feel familiar to them. And so we don't, when we think about who's in the, pi ev everyone's busy, everyone's busy. And the dirty little secret of every industry in the world is that we hire the first person that we know that fits, because if that's one problem solved, because I've got 13 people to cast. So I'm gonna cast these three that I already know, and then I'm gonna go out and audition for these and for the, every position my brother has ever gotten, every opportunity my seven figure earning brother has ever gotten in industry was because he knew somebody. And watching that happen, I've watched it happen in theater, I've watched it happen, and so I, Purposely, when I was casting at Impact Theater, I decided I'm gonna go and sit in the audience of theaters of color in the Bay Area. Because when I'm panicked and I need to cast somebody today, I want those five actors that first pop into my mind to be actors of color. I'm literally collaring kids in the parking lot like, hi, I'm Elizabeth Hillman. I'm like, you were great. What's your email address? 100% <laughs> true. And so what, what does it mean to create access when we have people in the pipeline who are all from a certain socioeconomic, cisgendered, white male? It, it's not about bending down to give access to somebody. It's about, this is the, this is the thing we talk about. I was uh, on a panel of people talking about what are we gonna do for Black History Month? at this school, what, what should we do for Black History Month? Maybe we should do something to foster black excellence, like I said. I'm like, you don't need to foster it, it's already there. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> they're already doing it, they're already doing it. You just need to hand them the mic. So uh, it's the same thing with disability, with gender, with my daughter just graduated from high school. My daughter was recently the first openly trans woman to graduate from her high school, the history of her high school. I was very, very proud and excited. But becoming disabled, re realizing I have a transgender daughter, these things, these issues, open my eyes to how little access there really is, which in turn opened my eyes to how little I had known about these issues before they were a part of my life. And that, that was a, uh, I've been disabled for quite some time. That was a mind blower for me to just suddenly see the world from a different angle and go and in with intentionality to learn about people who are not like me. And that is what the access is. We have access of process and access of product. The access of process is who, are, who creates the, the access of process, oh, I'm sorry, I need this for how, the access of process is who do we hire to create these stories? Who are our gatekeepers? The access of product is what are the stories we telling and how are we telling them? And our access of product is not gonna change while our access of process is still primarily dominated by able-bodied white men. As to the, when you are hiring, you have to, you can't look in your pipeline of white dudes from Ivy League universities. You have to look outside of that pipeline. We have to change the basic structure of how we do things to invite people in to ha with, to with the excellence that they already have. When we're funding, why are we funding big white theaters diversity initiatives, which is great, but and not funding at all black run theaters? Why <laughs> are we not doing this? So access starts at the gatekeeper level. It starts on your board. It starts on who hiring for your artistic director. It starts, the great example is the big thing around Glass Menagerie, which I'm very interested in right now. I'm hiring a Madison Fair Ferris in Glass Menagerie and I'm writing an article for Cal Shape about their upcoming Glass Menagerie. And I, I am, I was excited by Madison Ferris. I'm excited by the casting at Cal Chip. But 
think about this for a moment. No matter who you put in that role, Laura is a disabled woman who is a memory of an able-bodied man who is directed on stage by another able-bodied man. And I love Tennessee Williams with all of my bitchy heart. But, <laughs> but there also needs to be room for our stories. And on that note, shall I take this mic down to Andrea? <gasps> oh! <laughs> okay. Um, so, Tennessee Williams and the glass menagerie, that's a big part of my story because um, I've kind of just came upon plays like that. It's like, oh, she has a disability. Why isn't space, why do, why do people not really acknowledge that? And um, I remember, well, the controversy that just came up with the Broadway production is this exploitation, having a disabled artist up there. And it's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, do you? Want me to go into all my personal experiences? <laughs> you can, <laughs> Andrea. You can go into whatever you feel comfortable with going into. Um, I think we can all agree that this is not a safe space, but this is a brave yeah. space, and that what gets said here is again I have to say it again. What gets said here personally stays here. The life lessons, the learnings that you might get from this. Please disseminate them as widely as you can, but these stories are our stories. We keep these here. Um, well, something I wanted to echo that I've heard at this conference is um, if you're in the academic world, diversify your curriculum, and that includes disability. Um, I had never heard of disabled theater for quite a while. And then I just kind of came upon it. And I had to teach myself, basically, because it was not taught in the classroom. And um, I always kind of felt like I was never represented in what they were teaching in the classroom. I am starting to educate myself on disabled civil rights. And it's like, why did we not hear this in history class? But it's, it seems to be shoved aside for other reasons. And I won't say that they're not important reasons, but this is just as important. I also have personally had a lot of problems with access as far as buildings. And I think it's important to keep bringing it up because it really bothers me that Theater companies will say something like, we do not discriminate against people with disabilities. And then there are stairs to the administrative office. And it's like, you can't hire someone in a wheelchair. So aren't you discriminating? But again, I accept that there are reasons they're not always right. Um, and that, I think that not having that access is one of the problems that people with disabilities cannot get into those leadership roles. Because I can't even get an internship there. So 
Um, there are a lot of other issues about access, and I'm not. I'm trying not to bitch and moan about all my issues. So, anyone else want to? Um, I just. I would like to say a couple of things to that, and that is that part of disability is me dealing with your shit. And I shouldn't have to do that. I'm willing to talk to you. I'm willing to talk about it. But I should not have to negotiate your shit all the time. So please get over that. Um, I will tell you that as a college student in a drama department, I was cast, I was cast as Ham in Endgame. Really? Um, I was cast as a wounded soldier. And I was cast as an old man on the edge of death. Um, and after all of this, after four years, my professor, the head of the department, pulled me into his office and said, I need to apologize. And I said, well, yes, you do, but why? <laughs> and he said, because my mother died of cancer in my arms at a time when you couldn't tell people they were dying of cancer. And every time I see you, I think of her, and therefore I can't look at you. His shit, not mine. Unfortunately, it affected my career, right? Um, many years later, at a big one of those citywide auditions in Philadelphia, I came on, and I have a disability take on Richard III, right? And I do that monologue, and I know that monologue, and I've got that. And I hit that monologue. And if you, you've ever auditioned, you know when you got it. You know when you nailed it. You know that moment. And a man walked up to me afterward and said, never do that again. And I said, why not? He said, because you're so angry. We're afraid that if we don't hire you, you will hurt us. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's an actual, that's a thing. And I, when you look at disabled folks who do get hired, they're nice. They're nice, they're acceptable, they're fun, they're sweet, they do a lot of work around being friendly and making you comfortable. And I'm not gonna do that um, because there are enough people doing it. Um, I'm angry, it's okay, I own my anger. It's okay to be angry. But also, I mean, for example, I was walking with 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 Amrita Ramanan last night, and right now we're discovering that cerebral palsy actually is degenerative, much like post polio, um, and so I'm having trouble breathing. And I think she's a lovely, wonderful person. We had a great discussion, and I'm walking down the street, and I had to stop a number of times, and I'm thinking, oh my God, will she subconsciously discriminate against me? When, when she tries to hire someone because I'm having trouble breathing. Should I le let her go so she doesn't see my struggle? And it's that, but again, that's your shit. That's not mine. I purposefully gave Andrea the last kind of personal story because as disabled folks, we never get that. We never get the last word. Where our words are always analyzed and changed and made acceptable. So thank you for bearing with me. And know that when you talk about credentials and not having credentials and therefore not speaking, the system is set up so that we do not have access to get those credentials. And then we are discriminated against because we do not have the credentials that the system is set up not to give us. And so it, it perpetuates itself. I collapsed at Stanford. I was literally bouncing off the walls. I was so exhausted. I took my first year exam, and I looked at it recently. It could have been written by a fifth grader. It is insane because I was that kind of tired, that kind of exhausted. And I remember, because we had a big session about accessibility and about accommodation, and could I do this again? And Peggy Phelan took over the session and threw out the ex accessibility coordinator and began to scream at me. Scream. 
And her point was, how dare you do this to me? I fought for you. I believed in you. How dare you do this to me? I was the person falling apart, okay? I, could, I couldn't form a sentence. I was exhausted because the program was a boot camp, and I'm not a boot camp kind of guy. Um, and her response was, how dare you do this to me? And people were so shocked they left the room. And you could hear her screaming at me throughout the building. Um, again, her shit. But that affected me so much, I couldn't write for six months. Because I had been convinced I wasn't good enough. So even if we do not have the credentials, and I have a master's degree because a friend of mine fought for that and went to bat for me and said, God damn it, he's good. It's your system, it's not him. You're giving him a master's degree. And she won. Um, but even if we do not have the credentials, even if our own life experiences have troubled our ability to get those credentials, know that those life experiences are invaluable, okay? That you should not and cannot deny us access because of who we are and how we present. Trust that our life experiences are as valuable as a degree. How much time do we have? Where are we? Anybody? 15 minutes. Does anyone have anything they want to say? Does anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any feedback for us? Hi, so I have like a question slash comment. Um, this person who has other learning disabilities as well, I was wondering how you thought we could make learning disabilities more a part of theater and more acceptable on the education level and on what is being performed in theaters. I have a quick, a quick thought about that. It's not the whole answer, but it also relates to a lot of the different um, experiences that are being spoken about up here. So um, one of the things, that group that I was talking about earlier, um, Mothers, Artists, Makers, one of the things that they advocate is after you hire somebody, um, so not before, but after you hire somebody to ask, is there, like, so for um, parenting, is there anyone in your life that you're responsible for and is there any way that we can assist you to facilitate this while you work with us? And that question can be adapted to any number of, of conditions, right? After I hire you, is there anything you specifically need that we can assist you with to help make your work with us easier? In some ways, I think that that's the question, right? Like, so, uh, you know, there are other systemic changes, but I think it also has to come from the hiring processes to say to people they're allowed to articulate their needs. I do, I do. I, I've written about this issue. This is something that I care a lot about. Um, some of the finest theater artists I've ever worked with in my life have been severely dyslexic, and it appears to me that there is a disproportionate disproportionately high, higher, more dyslexic in theater than in the, in the general community. And um, I feel very passionately about learning differences as differences. Um, I've been teaching for 20 million years. I'm 27, 25, and, and, and they are differences, some very, very, so here's, uh, just very practically speaking, if your theater is having cold read auditions you need to stop. There is no excuse for having a cold read audition. I worked with new plays and new playwrights for 20 years in my theater company. You can get pages. It's fine. Do not do cold read auditions because what you're doing is you're making it impossible for somebody. I've had actors tell me, I just didn't go to that audition or I left when I realized or whatever, right? Don't cold read. If you want people to have material to answer questions, everything should be available in advance. Who are you auditioning? Who are you hiring? What's the interview process going to be like? What are you going to ask that person to do? So uh, being aware in your processes of the things that people need, asking them before they get there what they need. What do you need? Can you provide me a reading copy of the scene? Yes. Why not? Right? Um, can you give me an indication of what you might be asking? Whatever, whatever, whatever. We need to ask. 
for what we need, and when somebody asks, it's terrifying to ask for what you need, right? I've I have been absolutely in the like terrified of revealing that I'm in pain if I'm with somebody who might be in a position to hire me for something. So so I, I know it's terrifying to ask for what we need. Ask for what you need, but it's terrifying because very often people do not give it or they gaslight you. Do it. Do it. Who Oh my goodness. I I can I can do. I can do it. Hello beautiful young lady and oh you have it. I have it. You have it. I'm going to give yeah, the oh mind back to Brad though. Cater Scott, she, her, hers. I actually just posed this question um, on Twitter. Uh, and my question is, is the purpose of LMDA to be a watchdog for institutions who claim to welcome disability but are not wheelchair accessible? Kind of speaking directly to what Andrea was saying. Um, yeah, is, is it the purpose of LMDA to be a watchdog for institutions who claim to, be wel to welcome disability but to not be wheelchair accessible? Um, and then the follow-up is that like, for all types of access, if a mission statement of a theater company says uh, it's about diversity, but we see that it's not in the staffing, should what is LMDA's responsibility to call that theater or institution out? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. The answer is absolutely yes, that uh, as dramaturgs, I think we absolutely have a, a very affirmative and positive responsibility to be advocates for everybody who's potentially in our community, uh, whatever their whatever their situation is, um, and I'm I'm actually glad that you you raised this issue of watchdog because uh, Brad uh, invited us at the very beginning of the of the uh, session uh, not to storm out, not to you know refuse to speak and and whatnot, um, and so I, I feel like I would m be remiss since you brought this up uh, to say that it makes me extremely uncomfortable to be sitting up here with my colleagues and, um, and listening to, uh, to people call out individual members of the theater community for, um, for their actions uh, uh, without them being here to defend themselves. And um, Brad says, uh, this is just between us, but actually it's not, because there's hell around right there, so this is gonna be out on the, on the thing, and I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's justified. I agree, and I'm sorry, and I didn't think about that. Um, but I think that's part of the negotiation of the trip, is that we learn by doing, we learn by making mistakes. I made a mistake. There we go. I apologize. I'm going to invoke a little presidential privilege here. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually really emotional and upset right now. Um, I want to make a commitment, um, all of us together, and, and hopefully you'll get on board with this, but I don't want to have this panel at LMDA ever again. I think that LMDA uh, right now needs to step up um, so that we integrate all the things that we're talking about now. Ask Coriana to uh, set up a... Um, I would actually <laughs> change initiatives to essentials. What are LMDA access and inclusion essentials that we as an organization adopt right now, right here at this conference that we integrate all throughout, top to bottom, side to side in a horizontal organization that we will all commit to with the goal of not having to have a special panel to talk about issues of access ever again because we're gonna live it. Um, and uh, so uh, I don't know exactly what that's gonna look like. So I want everyone here to start to fill this out and I will commit and I know, um, and so we've got at least the next three years <laughs> of leadership commitment to change things. And I do want to have LMDA be model we are, we are small enough, I think we're united enough, we're nimble enough to model the things that we're calling for out in the greater field. 
and let and we've talked about yesterday in a huge action uh, breakout group about what does uh, dramaturgy, what does leadership in dramaturgy look like? This is what it looks like. This is us getting together <laughs> on the same page and saying this is the change we want to see in the world. This is how we're going to live the change within our uh, ability to do so. And uh, I think we can make a difference. One thing really quickly I would like to say when we talk about diversity, 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 diversity is not enough. Diversity is not equity. It's not enough to hire three black people and put them at the bottom rung of your thing and be like, look how diverse we are. Look at our box office staff. <laughs> it's not <laughs> 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 It's not enough to hire one trans actor one time. It's not enough to do one play by one person of color every three seasons. It's not enough. We need equity. Equity is more than diversity. Love, Melissa. I don't, I won't try to follow that, but I do have an action step I would like to suggest, and that is changing inclusion to opportunity. Because getting us in the building is no longer enough. We need the possibility to have the possibility. I want to suggest that every diversity fellowship include disability. That's my action suggestion. Amy? So many mics. Uh, Amy Brooks, she, her, hers, uh, Roadside Theater. And uh, I'm an able-bodied woman who's having to think about a lot of these issues for the first time in my life because uh, my father, who is older and whom I love very dearly, uh, is in final stages of COPD, which is a chronic lung disease. So his mobility is really strictly limited, and I'm having to think of a lot of issues of access to help him. Uh, which is a, a good thing for me, an important thing. Um, but uh, he's also a retired um, worker in the West Virginia Department of Rehabilitative Services. And um, he spent a large part of his career dealing with a lot of these issues. And I see that we have a Department of Rehabilitation right back there. So I was wondering for future conferences on site if we might coordinate with uh, people in the Department of Rehabilitative Services to make sure that our sites are accessible for people with a variety of disabilities, you know, physical and mental. Um, one, one thing I want to talk about, just as a resource item, um, is that the, the idea of hiring one trans actor once and then never hiring them again. But uh, so one sort of basic action thing is like mandatory pronouns all the time, but one thing I really want to talk about is hiring trans people to play cis people and doing, and, and that's one thing, but then more broadly when you're doing, um, when you're critiquing race or gender or something like that through casting, the responsibility of the dramaturg to make, the make that work within the story and to not just do it and be like, oh yeah, look at this cool thing that we did, to actually like tease out what is going on and like what happens when you have a trans woman playing a cis man who is exercising uh, masculinity in a toxic way because there are more interesting things going on there than if you were to just cast a cis man or something like that. And I think it's important to focus on the dramaturg's role to not let theater companies off the hook um, in that way and like really uh, dig into that work. Um, and I just want I wanted to say that because all the time you have people like Jared Leto play trans women in Dallas Buyers Club, which like, I mean, that's going to happen all the time, but it's a lot, th there is so much that can be done even in those situations to dig into what's going on there, and so often that work isn't done. I think that that's our job in a lot of, as dramaturgs, it's not my job as a trans person. It sort of is, if I want to, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to bring that into the room. Oh, sorry, I'm uh, Vivian Chase, I use they, them pronouns, which are also real pronouns. Marin Robinson, uh, she, her, hers. Um, I, I'm jumping back to the um, to the dyslexia question earlier, um, just because uh, I think actually we th one of the panels yesterday talked about blowing up the actor packet, and and so having worked with a dyslexic dyslexic actor in one of my past, you have I like uh, I uh, it was somebody I didn't know initially was dyslexic, and so the resistance against dramaturgy was actually a resistance against give being given 
lots and lots of written materials, and it made me entirely rethink when I when I realized that that was the situation, how I did my dramaturgy and making many different points of access, um, many that were visual or auditory or recipes, um, and in particular the cake. Um, so, 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 so think about that if you've been willing to think about that for a little bit. Hi, I'm, oh God, um, I'm Jen Plants, uh, she, her, and hers. Um, I just, uh, this was a really powerful panel for me, um, and I feel like I called myself out on some of the things that I've uh, been doing. And also as a person with an invisible disability, it was really powerful to hear that discussion. But I do wanna say as an action item, as a parent, um, what you said was really um, moving to me, and conferences in particular are often excruciatingly difficult for people with children, mothers in particular. Um, and there is certainly a double standard, which we could get into with gender issues, but something LMDA could do, particularly in a small organization, is think about childcare. I mean, I would be here with my child, which would be a really great experience for her, but the logistics of figuring that out, and I go to very few conferences because of that. I've done the coin toss with my partner about what's happening that weekend. I would be happy to head up that issue, and there's you know, a number of organizations of academic mothers that have made some good practices um, about that, and I think that's something really important we can put on essentials. Yes. Very. Well, I'm here for you. Okay. Very, very unfortunately, we have to end this panel at this moment. However, we should never end this conversation until we never have to have it again. I'm happy to talk more outside of this panel. I don't want to speak for other people on the panel, but I would bet that most of us would be happy to continue the conversation separately. Is there anyone who isn't willing to continue that conversation? Okay, there's our answer. Thank you all, and thank you for coming, and thank you for participating. Uh, we're on at 12 now, but just let me, we have, amazing uh, and we're gonna have to fight for like which room to be in for our next session because there's a lot of fantastic work um, happening in the next session so let me just point that out so here it's starting at 10 30 will be playwrights under the radar uh, conceived and moderated by Michael Evans in Osher a we've got uh, a couple of papers the work of belonging affect and anonymity in the me too monologues by Kari Barclay and the labors of the dramaturg between the black box and the white cube, uh, Eleanor Skimmon, um, and Unspeakable Legacy of John Beluso, Michael Chemers. So those three will be in Osher A. And then we've got a round table in Osher B, ensemble-based dramaturgy, a joint session with the network of Ensemble Theaters Conference in Seattle um, that Sally and Amritha are going to moderate. And then in Osher C, we've got the Sudbury Theater Center and Sensory Friendly Performances that Harutha um, will be uh, moderating. Okay, great, those three, four. Um, ready, break, 11 minutes.